three nine. And we looked last week at the old man and his deeds. When he pursues his deeds, when he stays in carnality, uh, the whole nation can go into reversionism. This week, I want to look at religious or ritual reversionism. Religious reversionism. We use the term religion in a negative connotation here at Grace Bible Church. There is a term that we use in the positive it's called Christianity and so religion and Christianity are two antithetical uh, devices we're going to see where religion comes from in Galatians excuse me in Genesis chapter 2 I want to look at verse 17 I want to set this up for you God created Adam God created Adam and he placed him in the Garden of Eden in perfect environment. And Adam was created a free moral agent. That means he wasn't a robot. He had freedom to do and to think for himself. Uh, Adam, he had a job. His job was to take care, to tend the Garden of Eden, and also to name all the animals of the earth. And by this, we know that Adam was a genius because if you begin to think about all the different species of animals and the variations, we understand it would take a tremendous mentality to be able to name them all. So Adam enjoyed his job. He enjoyed his days in the garden. Every day, he enjoyed his fellowship with God. He had Bible class every day with Jesus Christ. and. We understand that he had perfect environment. There was only one prohibition. We see that in 2.17. Look at it. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And in the, in the Hebrew, it's even stronger than that. In the Hebrew, it actually says, dying thou shalt die. We have the doubling of the verb for death. So God is saying you can do anything here in the garden, but do not eat of this one tree. And then we see as uh, Genesis carries on that God uh, created for Adam a helpmeet. We understand that in verse 22 that Jesus Christ violently ripped a rib from Adam, and he created a woman. And the, the word for build here is bana. It means to build from existing materials. And so we see that Jesus Christ himself built the first woman. I like to build things, and I can imagine how Jesus crafted this first woman of the human race. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm always working on something. And so he took this rib. Many say that that rib was the woman's soul and it was being incubated there inside Adam. He took that rib and Jesus Christ, he built in his workshop, see, he got this, in closed doors where Adam couldn't see. He built the woman. And then we see uh, at the end of verse 22, he brought her the hippie stem of bow to the man. This was the first wedding of the human race. And isn't it amazing that Jesus Christ walked the first woman down the aisle that he had built for Adam, and he gave her away uh, to Adam. And Adam, in verse 23, he's been, he's been looking at all the animals of the garden, and he found... The dog, man's best friend, and he found out that the dog was a great companion and that uh, the dog would serve him uh, unto death. He was just so faithful. But the, the dog wasn't really compatible with Adam as a helpmate. Uh, Adam found the horse, and he found that he could ride the horse and that the horse would plow his garden for him and uh, that uh, it was a great animal and they were compatible in many ways. but not as a helpmate. And now in verse 23, when Adam sees the first woman, 
of the human race that Jesus Christ himself has built. And Adam said, or he exclaimed, Now, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because he, she was taken out of man. In the Hebrew, it's in the exclamatory. It means that Adam, when he saw the woman, he exclaimed. He actually did a backflip because he understood. He saw her outline. He saw her beauty and that he understood that she was made for him, his right woman. And so we see that Adam and Eve lived in perfect environment. They lived in the garden. They had fellowship with God. They had sex in marriage the only right location for sex. And uh, I'd like to tell you, first of all, that sex was the first marriage, the first wedding gift that God gave to man. Jesus Christ gave Adam and Eve sex as the first wedding present. And so we see that they lived together in the garden for we don't know how long in perfect environment. And in verse 25, it says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. We know that uh, there are a lot of theologians that believe that Adam and Eve were clothed in a veil of light, and uh, that their glory of their perfect bodies were their clothing, and uh, this insulated the body so that they did not feel naked. And so we see in chapter 3 that the woman's uh, pet, uh, the snake, which then had legs, was going to uh, be indwelled by Satan, and Eve would be deceived by the serpent. In verse 6, uh, at the end it says, She also gave to her husband with her, and they ate. And so we understand that Eve was deceived. She was tricked. But Adam could have said no. He ate with his eyes wide open. In other words, and Adam was originally charged with the first sin of the human race. He ate of the forbidden fruit. The consequences began in verse 7. I'd like to tell you the first thing that happened to Adam when he ate the forbidden fruit, he stepped on a gumball barefoot. He stepped on a gumball right there, and then he tripped into the saw briars. You got that? Here, walk through the briar. Yeah. And he said, this is a new sensation. What has happened? Because he had never felt pain like this before. And then a red wasp came down and stung him <laughs> right between the eyes. And already he's thinking about this fruit he has eaten. And so... We find out that Adam did not die physically when he ate the fruit. The first time I read my Bible through, the first time I decided to read my Bible through, I said, God is a liar because dying thou shalt die when you eat of the fruit. I was expecting Adam to bite that fruit and just die, drop dead as a hammer. I mean, die right there because God does not lie. Well, what I didn't understand, I didn't have a pastor teacher yet. That taught me there's seven different kinds of death in the Bible. Adam had died spiritually. He had lost his human spirit. He would lost fellowship with God. He had cast the whole world into a status of spiritual death. And now the repercussions of his original sin became obvious. Verse 7, Then the eyes of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They had lost their veil of light. And the first human good, we're going to talk about human good, Operation Fig Leaves. And they were naked, and they tried to resolve their problem. The problem was spiritual death. The problem was no fellowship with God. The problem was they had lost their human spirits. They had been cast down into depravity. And now man, by man's effort, will seek to solve the problems of man. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. 
And so we see here that lost man finds the figs, and Eve had to go to sewing class, and she made some garments out of fig leaves. I'm sure they weren't very comfortable. And this was their solution. And this is the very first mention of religion in the Bible. Religion is man by man's effort seeking to gain the approbation of God. In other words, man is going to try to make God happy by what man is doing. And this is how religion is described in the Bible. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God, this is Jesus Christ, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is the time when they normally had Bible class. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Now, you can't hide from God. And this is uh, one of their reactions in uh, depravity. Verse 9, Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? Jesus knew where Adam was, but he uh, stimulated the conversation this way. So he said, I've heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And then the man said, Look, watch this. Pass the blame. you got to have this, kids. Pass the blame. If my daughter trips out in the middle of the yard and my son is nowhere around, if she trips and falls down, she looks around to make sure he's nowhere around so that she can blame him. You got that? And he does the same thing. He wants to blame sis. Well, guess where it comes from? Right here. The first man and the woman, they want to blame each other. And we understand from Christian integrity, we take responsibility sometimes when it's not even ours to take. Verse 12. Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me she gave me of the tree, and I ate. It's her fault. She did it. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me. I ate it. She blamed it on the pet. And so in verse 14, we have the repercussions of Adam's original sin. And so the Lord God, Jesus Christ, said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And so we see that the snake then lost his legs, and he had to crawl in the dust. We understand that the snake was indwelled by Satan himself, and that's in verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, that is, Satan and the human race, and between your seed, that is, the unbeliever's, and her seed, her seed is Jesus Christ. So that we see here, Satan hates the human race, and this is the beginning of that hate. He shall bruise your head. That's Jesus at the second advent. Christ is going to come back, and he's going to bruise the head of Satan when he comes back. And he shall, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the cross where Jesus took the nail for you and I, and they were driven through his feet. To the woman, he said, this is the curse of Adam's original sin. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. And this is not only childbirth, where the woman goes through the pain of childbearing, but also being a female. And you understand what it, uh, the pain and the uh, problems uh, that happen when a female comes into maturity. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. This actually means your desire over, your desire to be over him shall be for your husband, and uh, he shall rule over you. And so we see that the, the uh, wiring of the woman here, uh, part of this comes from Adam's original sin. Then he said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, you listened to her and not doctrine, 
and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it. And I want to tell you something. Men, we're going to work the rest of our lives, whether it's with our hands or whether it's with our minds or both, we're going to work the rest of our lives. And part of the reason that uh, we shall work and there's no such thing as retirement, is this curse. It's the curse of Adam's original sin. And I'm going to tell you what, socialism tries to do away with the curse here. It tries to tell you that you don't have to work anymore. And I'm going to tell you it's a lie. Uh, we understand from psychology a man without a job is more apt to go insane than just about any other member of the human race. And uh, we have millions upon millions of people in the United States right now drawing unemployment, not working. They are going crazy because God says here, you will work. And a man without a job is psychotic, neurotic, and uh, he goes crazy because he does not have the responsibility. Verse 18, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. See, I told you there was briars, briar patch right here thorns and thistles, and you shall eat the herb of the field. Originally, Adam and Eve ate, didn't eat meat. They only ate, uh, they were vegetarians. And we understand that God, when Noah came off the boat, he said, I've given you animals for food. And they continue to be our food uh, now in the church age. In the sweat of your face, you, you shall eat bread uh, till you return to the ground. For out of it, you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you shall return. And we understand that Adam lived 900, over 900 years after this curse. He goes on in verse 21. This is God's answer to religion. Remember the fig leaves? God's answer to religion. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God, that is Jesus Christ, Jehovah Elohim, made tunics or clothing of skin, and he clothed them. Now this is significant because Adam, all the time he had lived in perfect environment, had never seen an animal die. Nothing had ever died before. And we see here that Jesus Christ himself is about to take an animal and he is going to kill it and he's going to make leather clothing for Adam and Eve. We understand when we see the significance of an animal sacrifice in the Old Testament, every time it points to Jesus Christ where he would go to the cross and sacrifice his life for the sins of all the world so that Jesus himself took the animal and just as the priest in the Levitical priesthood would teach spiritual death he would teach about how Christ would die as he sacrificed the animal Jesus said to Adam and Eve he said the same way that this animal died to clothe you I one day will be born as a man and I will go to the cross, and I will die for the sins of the world so that you can be clothed in my righteousness. So that you can take off your human good, your fig leaves. That's man's by man's effort. And you can take God's grace provision. That's Christ and his death on the cross. And you can be clothed with God's righteousness and not your own. So we're going to look at Operation Fig Leaves, and I want, at this point, I'm going to try to share a PowerPoint with you. Normally, you switch that, don't you? Hmm. Operation Fig Leaf, 
That's Adam and Eve, and their human good, trying to gain the approbation of God, trying to satisfy his righteousness by their man-made clothing. Doctrine of human good. Now, we also use human good in a negative connotation. Divine good is the opposite. Human good is found in man. Man devoid of uh, God's plan. Man devoid of God's truth. And he pursues uh, to make God happy uh, by his own work. Divine good is that good of the believer that is produced under the influence of the Spirit. So point one, the doctrine of human good or operation big leaf, the first sin of the human race brought the first act of human good. In Genesis 3, 7, we see operation big leaf. Man by man's work, seeking to solve the problems of life. Their problem was spiritual death. This is why the Bible is so important. God has made certain that man cannot solve the problems of life without this. He has made certain that mankind cannot solve the problems of life without the Word of God. And when you see man trying to right a wrong through legisl legislation, when you see man trying to redistribute and things like this, He's doing that devoid of the Word of God. He's pursuing human good. Second point, God's plus R, His perfect righteousness, rejects man's minus R. Minus R can never equal plus R. Isaiah 64, 6 gives us what God thinks of our human good. It reads like this out of my New King James. But we are all like an unclean thing. That means that man is born totally depraved. He got an old sin nature from his human father. When he was born, God imputed Adam's original sin to his sin nature. And that caused him to be born spiritually dead. Eventually, if man lives long enough, he produces personal sin. That's three strikes. We're all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. The word for filthy rags here is actually menstrual rags. It's repugnant to God. And so Isaiah 64, 6 explains how God views our human good. It's minus R. It's repugnant to the righteousness of God. He rejects it. Point three, God's grace. God's grace made provision for man's lost estate. See, so man tried to solve the problem, spiritual death, through Operation Fig Leash. Jesus Christ said, take off those human works. You can't satisfy the righteousness of God with those. And put on this plus all, the righteousness of God. So in grace, God saves us. In grace, God gives the solution. Grace is God's provision. God's unmerited favor. God's great love for us. All that free, all that God is free to do for us on the basis of Jesus Christ and His cross. Man, since the fall, has continually pursued right standing with God through His own good works. Hebrews six one. I'd like you to turn over to Hebrews chapter six. Get through taking your note there. Hebrews 
Hebrews is a very important New Testament book. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6 could be applied to the United States right now. It just You could just stamp it across the map. Christians in uh, Christianity in the United States has devolved. It's devolved into religiosity, into ritualism. It's hard to get a clear salvation message now. <laughs> My daughter came back from a uh, Christian camp and uh, I always get a kick out of getting a report of what the uh, the speakers talked about, and and uh, it's constantly something sweet, like ask Jesus into your heart. You can't get saved that way. That's not a scripture. That's not. It's a distorted passage from uh, Revelation chapter three, where Jesus is not standing at the door and knocking. He's knocking on the Christian's door. And he's asking the Christian for fellowship so that he can come in and have fellowship and sup. That means to feast around the table of Bible doctrine. It has nothing to do with salvation. And yes, the false evangelist comes up with the idea that we can ask Jesus into a tomb. Spiritual death is like a tomb. The unbeliever is asking Jesus to come into a crash heap. To come into a room full of dead men's bones. That's what total depravity is. And he's just not going to come in. The Bible says that once we believe, put still in the air of tense, at one moment in time when we place that faith in Jesus Christ, that God the Holy Spirit comes in and he renovates our human spirit and only then Jesus can come in once God the Holy Spirit has made an adequate dwelling place for him. And so in the United States, we have all kinds of distortion. The same thing happened in Hebrews chapter 6. I want you, if you're at Hebrews, I want to I go through it with you right now. Therefore, because of these previous things, leaving the the, the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. This means the basic doctrine, the basic doctrines of Christology, like the incarnation, the hypostatic union, his substitutionary death, the priesthood, the resurrection, ascension, and second, these doctrines, leaving these basic doctrines, let us go on to perfection. We studied Wednesday night some of the words for spiritual maturity. Some of the ways God designates spiritual growth. And the word perfection here is spiritual maturity, super grace. Doesn't mean that we're perfect. No, it doesn't. It means that we have grown up. Christ likeness. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. The word for repentance is metanoia. It means to change your mind. Metanoia means to change your mind. It doesn't have an emotional connotation. There's another Greek word for that. It's called metamelomai. That means to repent, to get on your knees and to cry and to become indignant towards what you were before. That's not used here. It's called metanoia. It means to change your mind from dead works. This was the religion. This is human good. This is one of the very first doctrines you should learn as a Christian. How to get out of human good. How to turn your back on it. How to turn the other way. And what do you do? What's in the other direction? What's opposite to that? And faith toward God. A life of faith, where we inhale faith, where we take in the teaching from God's Word, and then when we exhale faith to life, 
We use what we learn out here. We apply Bible doctrine to our life situation. He gives a list of other basic doctrines of the doctrine of baptisms. There are seven different baptisms in the Bible. Laying on of hands. There's three different kinds of laying on of hands. Of resurrection of the dead. There's five different resurrections. And eternal judgment. There's seven different judgments in the Bible. Verse 3. This is the question mark in the United States right now. Verse 3. And this we will. This is the motto of Great Bible Church. And this we will. We will continue to learn Bible doctrine. Isagogically, categorically, and exegetically. These are categories that he's mentioned. And this we will do if God permits. If God permits us to stay here. If God permits us to carry on. And the question is, can we, through teaching the Word of God at Grace Bible Church, can we cause up, can we cause the people to grow up to perfection, to super grace, to spiritual maturity? And this we will do if God permits. We're not going to get, uh, we're not going to lose our goals by getting in the program. We're not going to start going out here and getting confused about all the different things that we should do. We're going to stick with Bible class. And this we will do. Verse 4. For it is impossible. It is impossible. He is about to make a statement here, a dogmatic statement. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened. These are saved. For people who are once enlightened. This means they have heard about Jesus Christ and how he died on the cross. And they have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. These were Jewish believers. They were in Jerusalem. They were believers. It's impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Born again. This is phase one. These are born-again believers. It's impossible for these born-again believers. Verse 5 is phase 2. And have tasted the good word. That's Bible doctrine. They have gapped it. So in verse 4, we see they're born again. And in verse 5, we see that they have been in contact with Bible teaching. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, or the powers of the destined age. So they had they had gone through some teaching. The writer of Hebrews is saying, it is impossible for these people who are born again, and they have been under teaching, if they fall away, they've fallen away from Bible doctrine. They've fallen away from grace, just like in Galatians. To renew them again to repent, to change their mind, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God. I'm going to tell you what they were doing. They had rejected Bible class, they had rejected their divine communicator, they had rejected their local fellowship of believers, and they had gotten back into the ritualism of the Mosaic Law. At this time, the temple still existed. It's about 66 AD. At this time, the temple still existed and the ritual sacrifices were still being carried on so that the believers rejected rebound. They rejected 1 John 1, 9 when it says, if we confess our sins, that's you personally, if you pray to God the Father, and you confess, that means you name, sight, identify your wrongdoing. If you name those to God, He will forgive and cleanse of all unrighteousness. They rejected that. And they said, I feel. I feel like I should go to the temple. I just don't think rebound works. 
I need to tell someone. I need to tell someone in public. In other words, this is self-flagulation where you're going to whip yourself. And they would go down to the temple and they would buy the dove there, the sacrifice, and they would have they would confess their sins to the priest. And the dove being uh, slain there represented Christ and the cross. The problem was Christ had already died, and the dove was the shadow of the real thing. And they were going back to the shadow and to the light of biblical truth. And so they pursued ritualism. They pursued religion. And they rejected dispensationalism. They rejected the power of the church age. And in verse 6, if they fall away, he's saying it's impossible as long as they're mired in carnality and re religion. As long as they're pursuing that ritualism, they can't come back. They can't learn. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame, that's it. It's as if they turned their back on the cross. Tragically, this letter was written to the Hebrews to turn them around from their religion, religious reversionism in 66 AD. They did not. They rejected Bible doctrine. They rejected rebound. In 70 AD, the legions of Titus broke down the walls of Jerusalem. They ransacked the city. They killed over a million people. They burnt the temple to the ground. They turned every stone over. They hauled away the artifacts. They ran every Jew from the city. Israel lost their nation. They were dispersed among the world. And so that religious reversionism is serious. What we're going to learn today is that God has a grace method for us to approach Him. He has made the way. He has provided the that everything that God needs, that that man needs to approach him. And the basis of every good thing that he has given us is the cross of Jesus Christ. I think I'll stop right there and we'll continue <clears throat> with our PowerPoint in just a moment.